So I'm just enjoying the bells. Those of us who are here in person, we have the gift of some bells. And they can call us home to ourselves in the moment. Mm -hmm. and attuning to what lingers. Noticing the state of the heart-mind, the state of the body in this moment. And maybe noticing a response from the heart mind to the sound that has now joined us and now passed. There are so many things I like about teaching at the collective, and I think that the soundscape might be at the top of the list. It's like life, you know? <laughs> You go to a monastery or you go to a Dhamma center or you like arrange your space just so. But the world is not like that. Like what we're actually navigating in our daily lives is stuff coming and going constantly. Whether they're thoughts in the minds or experience in the external world, it's like, yeah, there it is. And how we navigate that informs the quality of our lives. I'm sure that you've, I'm sure that you've tried to like, I just I just said these same words a moment ago, but I'm sure that you've tried to make your external experience just the way you want it to be. And sometimes we can for a moment or an instant as I take off my watch and my hairband because my body is now saying it's not like you those things that like we can for an instant make things just right. But it's fleeting because those things are changing and we're changing. It's constant, this constant change of Anicca just tumbling on. And the HVAC system and like navigating technology and being in the world, like in an urban environment, so much happening. And I love that. Because it reminds us that that isn't wrong, like that's not a problem. Life keeps showing up, life keeps showing up. Speaking of life showing up, does this make it a little easier to hear me on Zoom? <laughs> yeah, this is how it is, this is how it is. Hmm. So let's take a moment very, very briefly to simply arrive here together in whatever posture is most comfortable for you. You might already be in that posture, or maybe you wanna move or stretch, stand up, lay down, change your seating posture. It's gonna be less than three minutes, but even so, I'd like you to begin by attuning into this heart, mind, body. What's supportive for this moment, for this amalgamation you know, that you call Thomas, or that you call Michelle, like, or that you call Walt, like, you know, this amalgamation that, that is you. What's going on in there? Attuning to your direct experience internally and externally. And you might notice that in the tuning in, There's the experience. And there is the knowing. And there is the relationship to the experience. Three. 
three distinct dhammas. What's here? Resting. Opening. Noticing what's predominant in your experience. Some direct experience that's coming in through a sense door. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. Is there some awareness of the knowing of the experience? Awareness of the hearing separate from that which is heard? Maybe not, just checking it out. Maybe the thought, what is she talking about arises in the mind. Great, know that. or maybe in this third category of experience, the relationship to experience is known. There's some awareness of a liking or not liking, a chasing after or pushing away, or an awareness of "Ah," no, not knowing. Greed, aversion, delusion. Or maybe wise attitude is arising. Oh, it's like this. All right. Whatever is happening is constantly changing. As Ajahn Pasano said to me a couple weeks ago now, it's a blip on the screen. Are you aware? How's it feel in this heart, mind, body? I wish you would stop talking. I wish there was more silence. That's been more than two minutes. Knowing that this is what's arising and passing. And for those of you in person, enjoying the sound of the bell. A little wake up sound like we always do in the Plum Village tradition and then three full invitations of the bell. And if you're following along on Zoom, just resting.
gradually expanding the field of awareness, setting the intention to practice for this hour and a half together in awareness throughout our time. Bringing in movement, feeling the body moving, right? So that movement is not separate from practice, not outside of the field of awareness, but part of what we're knowing. And as it's available to you, allowing that movement to come from the wisdom of the body, the wisdom of the heart. Right, rather than a prescriptive, do this now kind of thing, a listening in to your own internal wisdom. And your movement might include having a sip of water or some other liquid. Knowing that, feeling that, experiencing that, the weight of the vessel, the coolness or warmth of the liquid, like, oh yeah, this is here too. And maybe when we slow down enough, we notice that there's an impulse that precedes the reaching for the liquid. I know for me, as I name that and I, I see Walt drinking and Karen drinking, I can feel, oh, my throat is a little dry. Like, oh, I want to drink a water. But it's not even articulate that I want to drink a water part. It's this just kind of like instinctive thing that happens. And because I'm teaching and I'm on camera, there's like, I don't just grab it, right? There's a little more, oh, yeah. That, yeah, there's a little dryness. So I am going to get some water, but like, oh, no, I have it. Thank you so much. If I, if I drink all this, I might take you off without a kind offer. But that, that I name it to name that that's happening all the time. And the frenetic pace that, that I keep, you know, maybe most of us keep, it, um, it gets in the way of the recognition of the thing that precedes the action. Tom, Tom knows what I'm talking about, right? It just gets in the way of that. And, oh, guess, guess what we're doing? We're just guiding our habits. No problem. Like, we have habits. Conditioned habits of mind, Thich Nhat Hanh calls it, it habit energies. And Saito Tejaniya, the language I've been getting from Andrea Fellow more recently has been habit patterns. And those are much deeper than just, like, going for the glass of water, right? And for some of us, are things we're interested in changing. But... I have noticed that, and I grew up in Philadelphia, in the middle of the city, and wow, I can go fast. I know how to go fast. Like a split second decision, like a split, 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 split second decision. I just go, and I know how to like go to fisticuffs and all of that. And I'm finding a different way, you know, almost 20 years now into practice. and. I find that slowing down, if I went at half speed in most of this country, certainly in, in California, I could go at like quarter speed and no one would notice that I had slowed down. And I forget, and I want to go really fast. And when I slow down, and I'm sure this is true for all of you too, that when we slow down, there's this space to see that like, the word hook is arising in my mind at the moment, but like that hook that precedes the, the action or the hook that precedes the thought. Y'all know what I'm talking about? On Zoom, you're with me? Some relating to that? Yeah, yeah. No problem. No problem. Our ancestors, our human ancestors and our mammalian ancestors and our reptilian ancestors. It's because they were speedy that humans came into existence. Right? It's not a problem. Those slow ones, they did not <laughs> procreate sufficiently <laughs> to continue, right? Like, so we come by super, super naturally, like not your fault. It's conditioned, it's conditioned and not a problem 
And we're in a day and age where most of us have enough relative safety that we can go a little slower some of the time, some of the time. And there's magic in that. There's magic in that space. And I know that for me, when I slow down a little bit, there's more opportunity for mindfulness to arise. It's just, it's like, a, it's a just, it's just there a little bit more. When I slow down, it's one of the conditions that supports mindfulness arising. And maybe some of you have also noticed that. And maybe not, that's okay. And I hope that as we engage in this series, you will notice that. You will practice to be curious to notice. <laughs> Are you enjoying the sounds of a phone? <laughs> Say it again, Lisa. I said, I don't think it's enjoying. <laughs> Is that what you're laughing about? <laughs> so notice the feeling of laughter. Right? <laughs> laughter is pleasant. Sometimes, no, the thing that, Lisa and I have a long standing relationship. I'm not gonna put someone on the spot like this who I do not know, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that's preceding the laughter and maybe the nervous response that elicits the laughter, that might not be pleasant, but the laughter itself is a pleasant experience. And so <laughs> see if there's the possibility to feel that, to feel the release, to feel that energy, right? And of course the, the habit of mind is like, that shouldn't be happening. That's what the mind is gonna do all the time about all the kinds of things you don't like. That's what it does, right? And shit happens constantly. And we get to practice, oh, and what's my relationship to that? <laughs> <laughs> what's my relationship to that and you know maybe it will reside it will kind of fall into the background as more things come into the field and maybe it will be here for an hour and a half for you to practice with we can't know that right but we can know that it's our, it's our ver <laughs> we can know that it's our aversion to the experience that's the problem <laughs> No, <laughs> it's, it's dukkha, right? First noble truth, right? It, it's just here, it, it changes. You know, the source of the dukkha is changing all of the time. It's always something, you know? It's always something, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna torture Thomas for a moment, but it's my understanding that Thomas is in the midst of a trip and going on an even bigger trip in a moment. And like, that's amazing and wonderful and so exciting. And how much shit did you have to deal with in order to arrange for this to be possible, right? And then you have to deal with flying and then you have to deal with navigating a foreign language and culture, like there's still dukkha, right? And sometimes there's a clear knowing like, oh, this dukkha is in um, service of something greater. I think you're going to India, but I think I made that up. I'm not sure where you're going. Bali. It's in service of something great. It's in service of a beautiful trip. Right? And even when we can't see like what it's in service of, it's in service of awakening. It's in service of freedom if it's met. If it's met. When it's not met and it gets under our skin and we just get all, you know, about it, that's not in service of nothing. Right? Just getting us more, more spun out and more twisted. But when it's like, oh, this is what's happening, and I have a relationship to it, it's like, oh, wow, the power of my relationship to it. It's amazing. And, you know, the sound of texting is like, you know, really minor dukkha. How great, great it is that we can hear, right? And I'm sure if you think about it for a moment, you've been through some worse stuff. We've been through some more stuff. Right, and I look at the screen and I know for a fact some worse stuff has happened. And I know from my own experience, I've been through some more stuff. I've been through some more stuff than just the last 12 months. 
right? And my practice of how I navigate the really, really, really minor dukkha informs how I navigate the, the life and death dukkha. It's, that's, that's, where the, that's where the practice is, that's where the work is. We can't just sit around trying to arrange life the way that we want it to be. And then when the stuff happens that we can't change, think that we're gonna have any luck then. Like you can't just like turn it on. Sometimes people talk about like picking up a tool in the mindfulness space, in the meditation space. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that. If you haven't been practicing with that tool, you can't pick it up. It doesn't work like that. They're not tools. They're practices that we develop and cultivate over time. Just as we develop some regulation as we mature into our adultness. Right? When a child is having a hard time on the airplane, maybe some of us have a habit of getting mad at the kid. But if we have some practice and some awareness and some skillfulness, we realize, oh, that kid is suffering. You know, like that pressure in the ears, it doesn't feel good. And maybe they're cold or they're in a brand new environment. Like when we are less agitated ourselves, there's some tenderness and compassion for the suffering of another or the experience of another. And everything changes. Maybe the best gift that there is when something isn't going the way that I want it to go. Oh, it's impermanent. This too is impermanent. This thought, this external experience, oh, this is impermanent. What do you hear now? <laughs> right? New sounds. <laughs> this is life. This is life. And the five precepts or the five mindfulness trainings can support us to navigate this life in amazing and, and profound ways. So let's dive into them. There's a, a big part of me that wants to go around the Zoom screen and around the room and do names and pronouns and have you all get to know each other a little bit and have me get to know each of you a little bit. And I guess I'm going to do that actually. <laughs> I was thinking of skipping it. So let's be concise. Name pronouns. You probably don't have to think about what those are. And I don't need a sentence, I'll model it. Name pronouns. And then let's take a moment now for you to drop into your body, into your heart, into this moment. And what is alive in you right now? Maybe it's an adjective. Maybe it's a sentence. Can you boil it down to one word? Or maybe two words with a comma in between. And if nothing is coming, you can just pass. And then here's the model. Augusta, she, her, tired, excited. And we'll start on Zoom. Tia, you, if you don't mind starting us off over there and then pass it to someone and we'll go around and yeah, if cameras can come on for a minute, that's wonderful, nice to see you. And if not, that's fine, whatever works for you. Tia and she or they and overwhelmed and um, calm, calm, calming, calm. Calming. The verb of it, yeah. Um, Anne, are you up for going next? Anne, she, her, and a uh, calm presence. Pass the mic. I just see um, seven stars, martial arts. I'll pass to you.
We're not hearing you. John, he trepidatious. <laughs> And then pass the mic, please, sir. Sanam. I hope. Sebastian. Sanam. Sorry, I think Sanam is going first. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sanam, she, her, uh, grateful. I'll pass it to Thank Sebastian. Thank you, Sanam. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sebastian, he and his. Um, live as my stomach, uh, and also peaceful. I'll pass it to Karen. Thank you. Karen, she, her, connected. I'll pass it to Walt. Walt, he, him, um, relieved and i'll pass it to did we already okay and keith okay uh i'm keith he him uh a little gloomy maybe maybe hungry <laughs> and we'll wrap it up with mia if you're it, if you're up for it. Mia, she, her, the anxious. Mm. Thanks, Mia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tia. And then from Jimmy, we'll go around the physical space. And let's use the, uh, Tia, let us know if we need to use the mic or not, please. Do we need to use the mic? I think it'll be a little bit clearer. I can hear you, but I, it's clearer with the mic. Thanks. Jimmy, he, him, they are gratefully at ease. Hi, Ron, um, he, him, energized. Let's go to Kim. Kim, eternally well. Rafi, he, him, I'm purging, mm. and I'm curious. Mm. Sarana, she or they, I feel giggly. <laughs> <laughs> the giggles are welcome. Uh, Victoria, she, her, they, uh, curious and kind of stuffed. Mm. Um, Michelle, she, they, feeling a little annoyed. Right on. Uh, Lisa, she, her, I feel lighthearted and. <laughs> no one's the word for that. <laughs> lighthearted and. <laughs> uh, Tom or Thomas, um, he, him, second guessing. Mm. Thanks, Thomas. Great. Let's settle into a bit more time of meditation in a posture of stillness. And I offer the suggestion that we engage in this whole hour and a half with awareness, but I hadn't mentioned, I hadn't offered a reminder and to perhaps many of us, that awareness or presence or mindfulness kind of subsided or slipped away, no problem. And we can practice so that we're inclining the heart and mind in that direction into an openness, receptivity and curiosity. throughout the minutes and days.
we can live a life of mindfulness. As we practice that, For as the Buddha taught, what the mind frequently reflects upon becomes the inclination of the mind. As we cultivate curiosity, we become more curious. As we cultivate openness, we become more open. Oh, this is what's here right now. Tuning into the body, discerning If the body wants to shift in any ways, is this posture sufficient? Is this posture supportive? Small shifts or big shifts. Maybe we want to stand up. or change our seating posture. Noticing where attention is drawn. what's arising in the field of awareness. I'm noticing your relationship to that experience. Can it be okay? that which is known, the relationship, the direct experience, the knowing. Oh yeah, it's conditioned, no problem. Really don't like that. It's okay that I don't like that freedom. Allowing the body to soften. Inviting the body to rest. Oh, it's like that. Resting and opening. Mm-hmm. 
no parts left out. Maybe even appreciating the full range of the human experience. Maybe reminding the heart, the mind, the body, that you're safe. Sure, things might not be exactly as you want them to be. Can that be okay? Of course, if there's pain in the body, it's important to move and tend to that. Resting, opening. beginning to get interested and curious about relationship to the experience. Noticing how aversion or greed feels in the body. Maybe the neck is tight. Or there's a leaning forward. Or a bracing somewhere. Or a sense of settling, ease, flow. Attuning to what's happening in your own heart, mind. Of course, the heart, mind, and body are responding to what's perceived through the sense doors. Not a problem. It's 
And we can cultivate mindfulness of that response, of that relationship. We can come to see that it's all conditioned. This moment. Has come to be. Due to causes and conditions. Yata Buddha things as they have come to be. Resting and opening. Developing curiosity. Coming to know what's actually happening in the present moment. as we rest and receive. No need to do anything. Cultivating awareness of things as they are and our relationship to that direct arising and passing experience.
What are you aware of? Just noticing. Not answering the question, but inclining the heart mind to notice. And how's that feel in the body? And maybe the mind starts to get involved, some liking or disliking. This too can be known. Resting. Opening. Oh, it's like this. Another arising and passing thought. Sound. Emotion. Belief. It's all just conditioned experience. Totally impersonal. Noticing our relationship to the experience, whatever the experience might be. Inviting the heart, mind, and body to soften. to release. To rest. It's okay.
resting. Really giving yourself permission to rest. Maybe getting curious about the direct experience of the body resting. receiving experience, cultivating receptive awareness. Oh, it's like this. No problem, this is what's here. and becoming interested or curious about our relationship, response, reaction, our relationship to our response or reaction, our relationship to the present moment.
freedom is found by not fighting reality. Not fighting the internal or external experience. It's all impermanent. As we enjoy the last few minutes of this style of practice, you might notice how it is to drop in some kind of wholesome mind state or thought. You might have your own expressions or you can borrow some of mine. I love you. I got you. I'm here for you. It's okay. And noticing how the heart responds.
receiving the sound of the bell. And inviting this receptive awareness to attune to the body, to discern any ways the body might want to move and feeling those movements, being in and with those movements. Perhaps the body would like a little gentle massage. Maybe the body wants to stand some big stretches or maybe little circles of the wrists or ankles or twisting it out in the torso. no right way to do this. All that I ask is that you tune into the body, your body. Offering it love through your kind attention. Continue to practice receptive <coughs> awareness, noticing what's happening internally as external experiences continue to come in, right? But intentional ones. So as you know, this is a five-part series on a blameless life, and the foundation for a blameless life is the precepts. The five precepts is offered by the Buddha and carried forward in the Theravada traditions or in the Plum Village space, what we call the five mindfulness trainings. I thought it would be fun to begin with chanting the five precepts and then the evening progressed in its own way and I was responsive to what was actually happening, which is how I prefer to teach. And so we'll chant now and if you're not into chanting, no, no pressure and no need, we'll do a call and response. So you don't have to read anything or figure anything out. And I am not a singer. So the sound will be however the sound is. And my hope is that that gives you permission to allow the sound to be however the sound is and to not be caught in ideas of it needing to, or supposed to sound a particular way. The first place I ever practiced Buddhism was in Thailand at Wat Suan Mok. And there were some benefits of chanting that were offered there that I want to share with you. And notice like what's happening in the heart mind right now, what's happening in the body. And can we practice this receptive awareness throughout the time that we're together? I feel like a lot of the Buddhism and meditation I've been exposed to here in the West, there's such a focus on sitting meditation. But we can only do that so much time in our day. Like even if we're monastics, there's only so much time that can be dedicated to that quote unquote formal 
practice. But as long as we're awake and alert, and I even have friends who have cultivated lucid dreaming. So not only when they're awake and alert, can they practice, can we practice mindfulness, presence, awareness. It's actually available anytime, anywhere. Like when we remember. And so that'll be part of what we're doing in these five sessions is practicing to remember. In the Plum Village tradition, we use bells of mindfulness to bring us home, to call us home to the present moment. And in the practice from Sayadaw Tejaniya, there's this new way I've been exploring these last few years. I've been a student of Thich Nhat Hanh since 2006 and training under students of Sayadaw Tejaniya um, wholeheartedly maybe about five years and exposed about 10 years ago. So that's part of what I'm drawing on. But in, the, in this way from Sayadaw Tejaniya, my mindfulness just returns. It just shows up without me doing it. Because I want to tell you, the me doing it, it was not giving me freedom from crazy behavior. But this new, like, open, receptive, which I was guiding in the meditation practice, in the formal practice, this receptive approach has been allowing for mindfulness to just return and show up. And it's a miracle. You know, I have been practicing really intently for 18 years now. And then finding myself being unskillful in speech and then getting quite frustrated about it. But I have significant trauma in my life. And so stuff gets activated. And now I'm not acting out on it at all. Like I haven't, I haven't said anything unskillful to my partner in quite a while. And we both like that a lot. <laughs> it is forward leading. And you know, thankfully he's had a lot of patience with me. We've been together for, for more than 10 years. But it's so much nicer when I'm nicer. And I'm nicer to myself. And I'm nice to like random people on the street who are behaving however they're behaving or customer service. I've been, I've been nicer. I like it. I like it. And I feel safe enough to be, to be nicer. And so that's why I'm practicing in my own practice and then sharing this more receptive, open way. And so try it on just for these five sessions or just for this next 20 minutes, right? Like, how is it to start to practice? Oh, what am I aware of? How does it feel like? What's my relationship to that? Because this interest that I've cultivated in my relationship to the moment, to the thought, to the external experience, I think like that's been the real game changer because then I'm curious about like the fire that started in me or the fear. Like I can see a little bit more clearly where the reaction is coming from. And then always, it's actually rooted in metta. It's rooted in this desire for safety and love and care. But it's this maladaptive strategy, right? Greed and aversion, I have been seeing more and more clearly, they're coming from a wish for wellness. They just don't know a better way yet. And then I have tenderness and compassion for them and whoo, everything is different. All right, receptive awareness, right? So noticing What's here in you, a little agitation, a little ease, a little delight. From Ajahn Buddha Dasa, the founder of Wat Swan Mok in Thailand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Tia. So y'all can be, those of you on Zoom can play with how much of the shared screen is on your screen where you can slide it all the way over so you're just seeing me or you can slide it back and play with gallery mode we're way into covid and post covid and wherever we are so i know you know how to play with zoom so you have fun over there this is not on the screen at the moment everyone here in the live space you don't need to look at the screen there's nothing over there you need thank you <laughs> so some benefits from Majan buddha dasa on chanting settles and calms the restless or agitated mind. Just noticing how those words land for you in this moment. Second benefit, mindfulness training. 
must be alert, nimble, and attentive to avoid mistakes. And so as we're chanting, we're cultivating alertness, a nimbleness, and attentiveness so that we might avoid mistakes. It's also a concentration training. We're focusing the mind on the words and their meaning. And it's a wisdom training, deepening our understanding of the teachings that can become direct realization. So it's often said in the Dhamma that first we hear it and then we experience it, but the hearing of it can incline the heart mind into the experiencing. And it develops confidence or sadha through familiarity and reflection, cultivates energy or virya, joy and patience, endurance. We, we stay with it, we stay at it. it. Develops a friendliness or a metta toward all beings. Fills the mind with skillful, beneficial thoughts. So there's less space for low or, or impure thoughts to enter. Thich Nhat Hanh often said, like, don't put your energy towards pulling up the weeds. Put your energy toward tending to the food plants or the flowers or the nourishing things. Well, we can get caught in trying to pull up the weeds, but that's not actually what's forward leading. We're not trying to like carve out parts of ourselves, but rather nourish the wholesome. So just chanting fills the mind with skillful, beneficial thoughts so that low and impure thoughts don't enter. Prepares the mind for meditation or bhavana. So next week, the intention will be again to begin with the chanting. We'll see what actually happens. Helps us to dedicate life to spiritual practice. And 11, familiarity with Pali. We'll start with Pali, the language that preserves the Buddha's words and its exquisite terms. And then from Ajahn Buddha Dasa at Wat Mok in Thailand and Surat Thani, number 12, Thai people will appreciate and love you. Love the like the heart, the heart of it. All right, you don't need me to read this more stuff on Chansey. Okay, so yeah, that screen would be great now, Tia. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, in the real in the live space here, you can look at that. You don't need to. You don't even need to look at it on Zoom. But for some of us, the reading is helpful. I don't know if it's big enough to read it from this space. So I'll just go word for word. And the translation that I'll offer is a little different from what's on the on the screen. Um, and again, continuing to practice awareness of the heart, mind, body, how it's all landing, noticing aversion or greed, all the different things that can happen. And please, your joining me will be a great support to me and to everyone. And if you're not feeling it, don't do it. Don't do it. And know that the intention is a cultivation of the precepts and of the practice for your own benefit. And so you can make a commitment to engage with these precepts and practices like for the next 10 minutes, which is the time that we have here, or for the week, or for the day, or just, yeah, I'll, I'll humor her and support the group by saying them, but I'm not interested in exploring this right now, right? Just, just to engage with it in whatever way feels supportive for you. And so for me, I like to put my hands together in, in what is called Anjali. And in the Plum Village tradition, we think of this form as being a lotus bud, the potential for awakening, join me or not. And so the first precept in Pali, I'll go word by word. So repeat immediately after me if you wish, or there'll just be some space and I'll keep going. Panati Pata. Where am I need? Sikapadam. Samadhyami. Beautiful. Thank you so much. It feels so good in my body. Noticing how it feels in your own body. And the translation that I like for that is, I undertake the training. Go ahead. To refrain from taking the life of any living being. 
Okay, maybe next time I'll do the whole sentence. Thank you for reminding me that we're speaking English and you don't need it word for word. <laughs> Adina Dana. Where am I need? Sika Padang Samadiyami. I undertake the training to refrain from taking that which is not offered. Maybe it is too many words. <laughs> <laughs> so process, we're in it together. Thank you so much for your practice. Sura, Sura Maria, Maja Pamadatana, that was too long. Maja, Maja Pamada Tana, where are my knee? Sika Padang. Samadhyami. I undertake the training to refrain from inappropriate use of sexual energy. Feeling the reverberations in the body of the Pali, of the English. Tuning into the heart, the mind, the gut. So the actual poly for what we just translated, now that my mind is settling, I'll give you, because that was the wrong one. Kame su. Mucha chara, where am I? Sika padang, samadhyami. Awesome. So that was the English that we just offered, and now the English for the Pali that we said before is the fifth of the five precepts. I undertake their training to refrain from consuming intoxicants which cloud the mind. Tuning into the heart and the gut. How's it feeling there? And the fourth of the five precepts. Musa, Wada, where am I need? Sika Padang, Samadhyami. Thank you so much. I really, and you can close that, Tia. I really love that I feel comfortable and safe enough to just go in and find the precepts and then get them tangled and out of order and that it's okay right i feel like there's so much energy out there to be to be perfect and get it all right and have it all dialed in and i know it's been like that for a long time but social media doesn't help at all right the filters we can put on our zoom image instagram all the stuff the Botoxing and all like a little fill here. Like it doesn't help with this idea that we're supposed to be perfect. And if there isn't something that makes me feel worse about myself and I've heard from many others, then trying to be perfect, I don't know what does. Cause it's not attainable. And then there's constant failing and just feeds the cycle of, you know, you all have your own version of it, but some form of I'm a piece of shit, right? The, the language that some portion of my mind loves is I can't do anything right. And it's not true, but it doesn't stop that thought from arising in the mind. 
and practicing with these precepts and actually having this commitment to train in this way. I love how clear their precepts are, that it's our training. They're not commandments, they're not shelt nots, it's I undertake their training. You're not supposed to do it right. Like that's not what's going on here at all. It's a cultivation of the heart and mind. And noticing how that feels, like whether it's resonance or dissonance. Helping your own heart and mind to keep practicing, coming back to your own heart and mind. Because like, yeah, of course, there's some interest in what's happening out there. And there's a need to be paying attention to a certain extent some of the time, different, greater and lesser extents, depending on where we are and what's going on. And yet some of us have a great training for a hyper vigilance to the out there. It can make us a little bit crazy. And that skill that we've cultivated due to unfavorable conditions, we can leverage to be more and more attuned to what's in here. We go, what's actually happening in my own heart and mind in the moment? And how am I doing with some guidelines I might have set for myself? Hmm. It's interesting. Like I said in my teaching, it's really important to me to be responsive to what's actually arising in the present moment and be attuned to that and navigating that. And so this evening, and sometimes that means not getting to all of the content <laughs> that I had intended to share or hope to share. And perhaps that will be a little bit more incentive to come back next week so we can dive a little bit more in to the first precept or first mindfulness training before before moving on to the second. And that content and that structure and part of the way I have in mind to engage with that is to chant as we just did at the beginning and to sit as we did, and then to go into the training as it's offered by Plum Village and offered by Thich Nhat Hanh, which is about a paragraph for each of the trainings. So like tonight it would have been just the first mindfulness training. So I think next week we'll, we'll start with that and then we'll read that after we sit. We'll read that a couple of times through and notice, start to tune into which words are landing for us. You know, where is their resonance? Where is that dissonance? Because it's a very interesting exploration of our own hearts and minds to see where we're finding alignment and not alignment with something. And the greatest gift <laughs> Maybe not the greatest gift. A great gift that I received from Thich Nhat Hanh was the invitation to take these trainings on and make them our own. To play with the words, to change the words, to make it alive for us. And so if you were reading them on Zoom, or if you, if you read them in a link that I might send, or if you read off of my piece of paper in the English, it doesn't say what I said because I'm offering you how I practice with these trainings. In part, to share my practice with you, tuning into your heart, mind, and body, and in part, to invite you to make the practices your own, to notice, oh, mm, yeah, mm, like, to be curious, to be curious about your residence and dissonance and what that might mean for you, to trust your wisdom. Hmm. Thank you for your practice. It's a pleasure to be here with you. There's a lot to navigate tonight. A lot like life. <laughs> a lot like life. And I hope there are some moments of presence and ease and the being together, practicing the Dhamma, being in Sangha, attuning to the Buddha, the potential for awakening in each of you. I hope that you can feel that and the goodness of it. Hmm. And may any benefit that may have been generated by practicing together in this way, may it support our further deepening into practice. May it support our 
liberation of our own hearts and minds and a kindness and a gentleness toward ourselves and others. And through that, may it ripple out so that our practice may be of benefit to all beings everywhere. Thank you so much. If you're interested on, on Zoom and in the flesh, if you're interested in receiving the five precepts as I offered them, if you go through the system and register for tonight or next week, whether you're going to make it next week or not, if you register for that, we'll have your email address and can send out what I offered this evening and the first, the first mindfulness training from from Thich Nhat Hanh. And those of you who are on Zoom land, if you can come in person, you're quite welcome. And this is not offered as a way to tease or torture you, but we have some beautiful, delicious, local organic raspberries that we're going to enjoy here in a few minutes. And I brought them in, and as I will bring in something each time we meet, as a way for us to continue to experience that the practice is available in all of the activities of our day. It's not just limited to time on the cushion, the proverbial cushion. And they're also a great practice in not taking the life of any living being because there, no one was harmed in the creation of these raspberries. Decent worker rights, People of color are the owners of the farm and the recipients of the funds and no pesticides were used. So you can feel good about, about the consumption. All right, peace out y'all. You're welcome to unmute and say goodbye. Great to be with you. Thanks so much for your presence and may your practice unfold beautifully. Thank you, Augusta, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Had to be with you. <laughs>